Today we're going to talk about getting the best possible analog video output from your Mr. FPGA. So if you want to hook your Mr. up to a CRT, there are plenty of guides out there that will tell you how to do it as far as what cables you need and how to edit the INI file so that the analog output works in the way that you need. All of these guides will reference having some kind of DAC or digital to analog converter. This could be built into your mister already using an add-on board, such as the Retro Castle VGA or Saturn boards. Now you may not have one of these add-on boards and you only have an HDMI output on your mister. That's fine as well. They may tell you to buy an external DAC, which will take the HDMI port and convert it into VGA. That VGA port can then be used to go into an RGB input, component, composite, or S-video. And that's fine as well. But they never go into detail on what these DACs are, or what makes one good or bad. And there is a ton of data out there, thanks to Kurohoo on Twitter, which will tell you exactly what is a good and bad DAC. This information is so useful that it has actually been used to improve other DAC boards out there in the retro community, which is great to see. We can use this data that Kuro's created to find the best DAC for us and go through a list together, which we'll do later in the video. For now, I want to talk about what makes a DAC good or bad. Kuro has a document created that goes over this entire testing process and what makes something good or bad as well in much more detail than I'm going to go into. But as a very brief explanation, when you have something like an RGB output, you'll have your red, green, and blue cables. You can hook those cables up to an oscilloscope, and they will get you a value in millivolts. We take that millivolt value and compare it to a known reference level. Now, because we're working with analog outputs, they're not always going to match these reference levels perfectly, but we do know what tolerance we have for what is still considered a good or great DAC. These test levels are found by opening up the Super Nintendo Core on the Mister and loading 240p test suite. We then open the 100 IRE test pattern. If you watched my calibration video, you'll remember that this is the pattern we used on the Wii or whatever else you were using as your source in order to calibrate the monitor itself. With this pattern opened up, Every 10 IRE steps, we should see an increase in voltage on all three of the lines equally of 70 millivolts. So at 10 IRE, all three of the red, green, and blue lines should each read 70 millivolts. At 20 IRE, they should all read 140 millivolts, and so on, until we get to 100 IRE, where all three of these values should read 700. There are two useful pieces of information that we can get out of these values. First, if they are too low at the lower IRE values or too high at the higher IRE values, we're going to start losing picture information. And what I mean by that is if your voltage is 30 millivolts at 10 IRE instead of the 70 millivolts it's supposed to be, the image is going to be very dark when you're in a darker scene so dark that you can't actually see anything that you're supposed to, such as the cobblestones in this scene in Final Fantasy VII. They'll just disappear into darkness. Even if you increase the brightness of your set, if it's too low, that information may be lost and just show up as gray when you increase your brightness. Similarly, if the values are too high at 100 IRE, that means we're gonna lose picture information to brightness. So if we're at a lighter scene, things are all gonna merge into the same white color and we won't be able to tell the difference between anything slightly darker than that, even if we lower the contrast of our CRT. In my calibration video, we also talked about how adjusting the contrast or the brightness affects all of the other values that you've calibrated on your CRT. So even if you did increase the brightness or contrast to fix this, you're now throwing off all of that hard work of calibration you did, so this is not a tenable option. The other useful value that we get, aside from if they're too low or too high, is a comparison between all three of the RGB lines. For instance, if I'm at 100 IRE and my red and green are reading at 700 millivolts, you're going to think that's great. But then you look at the blue and it's at 770 millivolts. Well, that can't be right. 
and you plug it into your CRT, and now your entire image has a blue tint to it. It may be subtle, it doesn't have to be that obvious, but it is still there. So now all of my calibrations are thrown off again, and I could recalibrate to adjust for the blue level being too high, but now when I plug in anything else aside from that DAC to my CRT, it's not gonna look right. There's gonna be too little blue on all those other sources. And that's why it's so important to find a good DAC that has something close to reference quality. Even if it's not absolutely perfect, we want it to be as close as possible. Let's get Kuro's list pulled up of all of the DACs that he's tested, and I'll explain what the information actually means. Although Kuro does explain all of this in the document itself as well. We'll also talk about the DACs that are recommended on this list, as well as their prices, so we can go ahead and make a sort of tier list that you may want to choose from. Here's the list Kuro created. Now the list you pull up is going to look slightly different than this one. I got rid of a couple of columns so that the rest of this text all shows on the screen at once, but the list you'll have will have the dates pulled up and the source that it was used for the testing as well. Up here at the top, in blue, we have all of the reference values for the different IRE levels. So at 10 IRE we have 70 millivolts, then 140 millivolts, and so on, until we get to 100 IRE. And you can see here in the notes that one IRE increase should have a 7 millivolt increase. Over on the left side here, you'll see ratings with star levels as well as colors to them. So anything in green is basically a good DAC, which is a three star rating. You have a four star rating of great DACs, and you have a five star ratings of reference quality DACs. While we're looking at this list, you'll see all of the values here that Kuro has tested and an explanation of why they are so bad. There will also be a key down at the bottom that's missing from mine that will tell you sort of what the tolerance levels should be for these analog outputs. So something like these AG6200s that are outputting 25 millivolts when they're supposed to be outputting 70, that is basically unusable. Anything you see here in red or yellow should be avoided. No matter how cheap they are, no matter how easy they are for you to get, they are going to have some kind of issues. The most common chip in the DAC world is the AG6200. In any cheap DAC that you find on Amazon or AliExpress, there is a very good chance it is using the AG6200 chip. The main issue with this chip is that the low levels on it are completely off, especially down at 10 and 20 IRE. The issue with these being so far off is that the image is completely crushed and you lose all detail in the dark levels. I've taken two pictures myself from two DACs that I own. One is this 5-star Icy Box, and the other one is this 1-star Ranky Adapter. I'll compare those two on the screen right now. On the left side, I'll have the Ranky Adapter with the improper levels, and on the right side, I'll have the Icy Box with the proper reference levels. You can see just how different these images are. If I had a perfectly calibrated CRT that I had spent hours and hours working on perfecting and I hooked up this Ranky adapter, nothing would look right. I wouldn't be able to see half of the things going on on the screen. On the right side, you can see that everything looks perfect. I can see the detail in the cobblestone at the bottom right. I can see the pipes in the middle of the screen right below the little clock tower, and I can see the debris above the little red and white crossing sign on the left side of the screen. So that's why these should be completely avoided. I want to edit this in later because I know someone is going to bring it up. There is a mode in the Mister called Limited Range 2, which will try to fix these terrible DACs by lifting the lower levels and keeping the higher levels normal. However, it ends up lifting the higher levels as well, causing them to be way above the values they're supposed to. So please do not bother with these adapters. Now, if we go ahead and click on the link here, which by the way, all of these DACs have purchase links in the list so you can easily find out where to buy them. We can click on it and see that this thing is eight or nine dollars, which is very cheap. However, we can also go up to something like this, let's see here, this four star Ventian adapter. It's me from the future again. We're gonna cut this section out about the Ventian adapters because it turns out they have completely sold out. 
You can find adapters by the Vention company, however they are not the one we're talking about in this video. They're based off of the AG6200 still, so we're just going to ignore them. The next closest in price is the Icybox 502, which is reference level, but there are a couple of issues with this deck. First of all, it comes from a site called Groovesland, which can be trusted, it's not a scam site or anything. However, they have stock issues with these decks, and these are not always in stock. They also will randomly delist things and stop selling them completely for essentially the rest of time without any kind of warning. So these could disappear at any time. So if you only have HDMI out on your mister and you don't have a 3.5mm jack or anything like that, this won't come with an audio output. Now this AC522 from Icybox does have an audio output on it, as well as the one from AliExpress. So if you don't have audio, you may need to get one of those. If you absolutely need to get one of these from Amazon and you need it soon, I recommend getting these Benfei adapters. These are $8 each. If you click on this link, it's gonna bring you to a two pack of them for 15, but there's a selection on the Amazon page for just one of them for $8, and this is, again, uh, a good deck. So this has a three-star rating, and if you need it right now, you can get one of these. I do want to add real quick that I just bought one of these Mo Reed adapters because I thought it had the AG6200 in it based off the list. However, it seems like they did swap the AG6200 out for the same chip that the Benfei adapter has. So if you can't find anything else and you're completely desperate, it may be worth taking a shot on these and popping it open real quick to see if it has the correct chip and returning it if it doesn't. Uh, the case does open up very easily and you can put it back without anyone knowing that it was ever opened. If you don't own a mister yet and you want to buy one that actually has an analog output built in, that way you can use an analog output and the full scaled HDMI port at the same time. You have two options on this list that are good and that are recommended. This first one here that says resistor ladder, you'll notice in the full list that you'll have pulled up, it is for the Retro Castle analog board. And that's what I have on my system and I can tell you the analog output from this is great. The other option and what honestly at this point may be the better option is the complete Mr. Plus. This is another option if you don't have a mister at all and need to buy one uh, complete with an analog output built into it. The advantage of this one is that you get 24-bit color, uh, which only really applies to PS1 games, um, so it's not a huge deal, but that is something to consider here, although it does have slightly, slightly worse readings from the Retro Castle board, although it is still ranked very highly and I, I don't know that it's a huge issue. So those are the recommendations sort of in order to me, I guess. The Icy Box, the Ben Fay, the two boards with the good DACs built into them. You may notice that I ignored these HD Furies. There's the four and the three. That's because these are a few hundred dollars. You can get them in a group buy for cheaper. However, you're not going to get anywhere close to the price of these other adapters that are all listed on here. So, all right, that should be everything you need to make an informed decision on which DAC to buy for your Mr. Analog setup. My other hope with this video is that the AG6200 based DACs, such as the Ranky HDMI adapter, stop getting recommended. At this point, there is no reason to buy one. We have two cheaper options, which are significantly better in testing, and we have one slightly more expensive option as well that comes in the form of the Icy Box. If you're going to be spending hundreds of dollars on a mister, and hundreds or even thousands of dollars on a PVM and BVM, and maybe even hundreds of dollars on a retro tink that you're going to feed this analog signal into, it can't hurt to buy one of these properly leveled adapters instead of just getting the Ranky because it's the one that's always been recommended. We have the numbers now, we have proper testing done to where that thing and any other AG6200 based DAC should never be touched for anything involving retro gaming. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. If you need help with things like a recommendation, I can try to find one for whatever area you're in. But all of these recommendations should be available fairly globally, so there shouldn't be any stock issues depending on where you live. 
I also want to thank Kuro again for all of this data. Uh, it has already been used to help the community, and I'm sure it'll be used in the future as a reference for anything that needs a DAC in the retro community, or at least I hope that's the case. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.